Your pet would like to have a word with you. In fact, your dog, cat, bird, horse, fish, even bearded dragon would like to have an entire conversation with you. But having that trans-species discussion is difficult without an interpreter or go-between. A specifically skilled individual who's been communicating with our animal friends for more than three decades. Bridging gaps in understanding. Elevating relationships. Building peace and harmony among all Earth's creatures. That person is Susan Vaughn, the Animal Whisperer. This episode is called Cat Scratch Fever. Archie was a magnificently wild cat. Bengals are known for their jungle cat looks and iconic markings. He felt like such a free spirit who showed me his home was a vast open plain that appeared to be the African savanna. And that was a tad confusing because I knew this cat was in a domestic surrounding even as my intuition turned to focus on him. What happened next was startling and graphic and the remedy he requested to fix the situation was astonishing. Turning my full intuitive attention in Archie's direction, I opened myself to him. He leapt onto my chest and dug his ethereal claws deep into my skin, completely obstructing my heart center. The image he sent me was alarming, so I blinked and refocused my sixth sense, asking Spirit if I was seeing the right picture but the image remained unchanged. I told my human client, Susan, this is a dangerous cat. He's telling me he doesn't like humans and he doesn't trust us either. He says, you never know what they're gonna do next, but it probably won't be good. And I have to be honest, when you first said you've got a very dangerous cat, he's a very dangerous cat. My first thing was, mm, I don't see him as being dangerous. You know, I don't see anything dangerous about him. I see a very anxious, un, he's, he, I can't even say unsocialized, because he was socialized. But um, I didn't see dangerous. Well, he showed me dangerous. Archie was a gorgeous Bengal cat, the strikingly marked desert cat from Southwest Asia that's half wild and now half domestic. <coughs> Susan had been rescuing Bengal cats for close to 20 years. And she knew this poor Bengal cat had been treated very badly. So she wanted to find Archie a suitable home. At only three years old, Archie had been caged most of his life. He'd been used for breeding, which meant that every once in a while, a domestic female cat was thrown into the cage with him. His first humans labeled him destructive, so he was also declawed on his front claws. He was not only angry, he was also way out of balance. Susan said Archie felt unpredictable and wild, but she interpreted his behavior very differently when she first brought him home. So I bring him home and uh, he's just a purring, loving machine. I mean, he can't get enough of me. I, I had him upstairs in our guest room and I have a couch and a bed and all the, all, you know, houses and cubby holes and stuff, lots of windows, and he just was on me. I mean, he was just all over me. And then I left, was going to leave the room. This is the first night to get him some food, and he bit my leg the first time. So uh, I got on my antibiotics and stuff, but I just figured he's just, it's all the transition that he's going through. That's how I attribute it, because he wasn't an angry cat. He wasn't mad. You know, he just, he, he just, I didn't take it that he didn't want me to leave. I just took it like he wanted more. You know, that's how I took it. Susan is an experienced Bengal cat rescuer. So even though she attributed Archie's behavior to a disrupted life, she was still cautious. She knew his breed well, and she had experience with badly treated Bengals. Archie allowed her to handle him and even put him in a carrier. She took the extra step to set up a meeting with the shelter's animal behaviorist, and the next time she went into his room, she used a large plastic sight blocker, a physical barrier she placed between herself and Archie. The safety measures she put into place seemed to be working, but her years of experience told her she should still be cautious. 
they're so traumatized. They're trauma. They, we call it the Bengal brain because they're they're bred with a the, the domestic cat is bred with a wild animal, and even though it gets further away from the generation, and he was definitely further away from the foundation, he still has the patterns and the prints of the wild animal. So he still got that in him. If he didn't have that in him, he would just be a regular domestic tabby. A Bengal cat had been part of Susan's household before. His name was Van Gogh, and he was with her for 16 years. Like his feral ancestors, he was a solitary animal. He hid when guests came over. He didn't like being picked up. He insisted on making the approach, and he resisted being told what to do. He squirmed away from anything that felt like restraint. Hugging, for example. <laughs> she interpreted that as fearful or shy, but it was more about his genetics. Part leopard, part domestic cat. Van Gogh never hurt her, but Archie was a different animal with a traumatic past. Now this shows me that some of them cannot be rehabilitated. They just can't. They don't want to be. They don't want to be in this life. They don't want to be with people because they don't trust us. They've learned not to trust us. Susan had fostered an angry, feral, blue bangle cat before that she thought was never going to be domesticated. But shelter people advised her to just give him more time. That experience taught her that time could indeed be the magic balm. And when he came in, they brought him to me, and when he came in the carrier, he wanted to kill. He, he was in that carrier, and he, he was angry, and he wanted to kill. Twice, he came out of that carrier and nailed my arm with his claws. And he was, he wanted, I felt he wanted to kill me. So I called some feral people that rescue, and I said, you know, I just, I've never worked with feral bangles. I think he's feral. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know what to do. And they said, well, just give him time. Okay, okay, so I gave him time. So within three months, I was trimming his nails, I was putting a harness on him, and I was walking him on the patio so he could get some exercise within three months. So this was a cat that clearly was someone's pet at some point and got out and wasn't neutered and then got, you know, got used to being out in the wild and then got traumatized with trapping and neutering and shelter and transporting. But Archie just wasn't that cat. He was very clear about that. He had made friendly overtures towards Susan, including jumping on her lap shortly after arriving at her house. But his word picture said he didn't trust humans. He attacked me in the pictures he sent. And when he attacked Susan for real, he was relentless. He just kept digging in deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And when I'd get him off of one spot, he'd go for the spot that I was using to get him off of. Um, it was frightening because I didn't know how I was gonna get out of it. I had dropped my phone, it was in the middle of the room. My husband was gone, I'm up in the room, I'm at the door trying to get out and I couldn't get him off of me. So finally, he, the only way I think I got him off is he finally, his adrenaline just released, I guess, because of all the injuries, <laughs> I guess. I don't know what got him off of me. I, it wasn't me that got him off of me and I was able to get out. Archie wrapped himself around her left arm then her right arm, then her leg, and he wouldn't let go. He bit with his teeth, he scratched with his back claws, and he did so much damage to her limbs, she thought about calling 911. Until that is, she realized she had dropped her phone in Archie's room. By now, Susan was trembling and badly shaken. The cuts on her arms and legs were bleeding profusely. She washed the blood off in the shower, wrapped her battered limbs in bandages, and drove herself to the emergency room. Her husband eventually arrived home and easily put Archie into a carrier. The two of them took him back to the shelter. But that left Susan feeling like she had failed. I want to fix things. You know, I want to help them. That's what I'm here for. I'm not here to take them and make a judgment that they're not gonna be okay and put them down. That was, that was the most difficult thing I've ever done. And 
because I think every I think every animal deserves a chance. Without your help, I would not have understood that he didn't want a chance in this life. He wanted to be free. He wanted to be wild. He wanted to have a vast territory, whatever it took. And humans were not able to give him that. So he wanted to get out of his body. So is Susan still in the Bengal rescue business? Why wouldn't I? It's not like they don't need help, you know, and I can help them get into the right homes. She's got three little Savannah kittens right now and she thinks that's the next popular designer cat. These cats are also half wild. They're the offspring of the African serval cat and a domestic cat. You know, so that's another issue. I mean, I'm not against purebred animals. I don't know that I'm for them against them, but I am against breeding a wild animal with a domestic animal. I, I just think there's no place for it. So now that there's so many Bengals that need help and are being dumped, that's when the Savannah breed came into place. And 10 years ago, I said, well, that'll be the next big rescue because they're, they're, they're selling them for lots of money and people don't know what this, breeders don't know anything about the animals. They, they really don't. And so here I am, uh, this is my probably seventh or eighth or 10th Savannah cat. Even though these cats are sold for between $1,500 and $10,000, many that Susan has rescued have a plethora of diseases. Because they need a raw meat diet, they're prone to urinary tract infections when they're fed regular cat food. She's encountered Savannah cats that had several diseases because money was the only motivation of the sellers. And she recommends that people who buy Bengals or Savannah cats ask questions, meet the parents of the cat, and check out the facility in person. Don't buy an animal in a place where you see a wild cat pacing back and forth in a cage, she advises. Check medical records to make sure they've recently seen a veterinarian. And plan to feed the cat a raw diet or don't get one, she says. During our one hour interview on the phone, the kittens destroyed a pillow and a lamp. They need a lot of action, play, and stimulation, preferably from nature. Both Bengals and Savannas are voracious hunters and can decimate a bird or squirrel population in a short time. They like to play rough. And many don't want to cuddle, and most want to get as close to the ceiling as they can inside your house. They howl, and sometimes relentlessly. Listen, when Archie was up in that room that morning, I was taking him to the clinic and howling and howling and howling. I was heart, it was gut-wrenching and heartbreaking for me. That's why I said he just won't stop. He's relentless, you know, and it was upsetting all the cat. He was upset. He was. He was upset, it was upsetting everybody in the house, all the other animals in the house, it was breaking my heart. And you talk to him and he, he quieted down. I mean, I told my husband that and he didn't believe me. I said, well, you should have been here then because he quiet, I called you at 1039 by 1041, he was silent. I mean, he was silent and he was silent. He let out one little yelp, one little howl on the way to the clinic. Other than that, he was silent. There's very little regulation on owning Bengals or Savannah cats. In fact, in some states, they're prohibited altogether, but in other places, owning them just requires a permit. So I asked Susan, what did animal communication offer you in this case? Help. <laughs> you have, you know, <laughs> this, this couldn't have been, even, even after it all happened, when I reached out to you again and said, this is bad. This is really bad. And I was shaken, obviously shaken. At least I had someone to call to walk me through it. You helped me get through. You helped me process what was taking place, you know, what, what needed to be done. I couldn't have done that on my own. Animal control would have taken him and put him down and I would have felt horrible. Archie's early life had set the stage. He told me he did not want to be a domestic animal. He wanted to run free. And if that wasn't possible, he didn't want to live. I knew the exact time his soul would be set free, and I checked in with him just after he was euthanized. 
he showed me that he was running free on the vast plains of what looked to me like the Serengeti. Huge, wide open spaces where he could be wild. Domestic life was not a life at all for Archie, and it just wasn't what he wanted. And humans could not make the decision to just release him into the wild. Most felt it would be irresponsible for them to do that. And so Archie did what he knew would force their hand. The final picture of the spirit cat he sent me was satisfied, prowling, sprinting, and running at high speed over a wide terrain. He felt balanced, contented, and right where he belonged, on the plains of an African landscape. For more episodes in the series, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. To learn all about Susan Vaughn and her services, visit her website at animalwhisperer.net. Be part of the community by subscribing to her Facebook page, animalwhisperer.net. Then sign up for Susan's newsletter to enjoy more of her fascinating animal-human communication stories. So until next time, join Susan as she talks to the animals on The Animal Whisperer.